the seed bed or the seed plot of the Bible, <clears throat> that must be the result, to stand in awe of God. Yes, we can stand in awe of all that he has done in the vastness of creation, but ultimately we don't just want to worship creation, we want to worship the God of creation. And so we stand in awe of him. Now we looked at the first two verses of the Bible last week, verses 1 and 2 of chapter 1 of Genesis, <clears throat> and we were reminded of how it all starts with God Elohim, the plural name for God. So in other words, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were all active and present at, uh, at creation. Now today, as your bulletin will have told you, the plan was to look at days 1, 2, and 3 of creation, verses 3 down to 13. <clears throat> as I've been preparing um, during the week, I think I might struggle to get beyond day 1 today. So we'll just see how it goes. And if we don't get beyond day one, well, we'll carry on next week. The scriptures will still be there. So let's read the passage. We're going to read right through to verse 13 because we're going to see how we get on. And I'm actually going to read from the beginning of the chapter again. So Genesis 1 verse 1. Hopefully I don't need to tell you which page number it's on. <laughs> verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the, uh, from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening, and there was morning, the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father God, we come to you as we consider these verses of Scripture. We recognize that every Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for correction, for encouragement. So Lord, would you teach us today by your Holy Spirit? If it's needed, Lord, would you correct us? Would you encourage us? Would you draw us nearer to yourself? Would you help us as we consider the marvel of your great creation? Would you help us to stand in awe of you, O oh God? Bless us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Remember that um, last week, when we considered verses 1 and 2, we noticed what it says there, that the earth was without form and was void or empty. <clears throat> and over these first three days, days 1, 2, and 3 of creation, the earth starts to have form. It starts to take shape. Now, I want to clarify something that was covered in, uh, in a session last week, but I felt it, uh, it appropriate to say it again. Um, I believe that verses 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, verses 1 through 5, are part or part of day 1 of creation. I briefly alluded um, last week to the so-called gap theory, the argument that some would suggest that... Um, 
that uh, God created the uh, heavens and the earth, and then there was a, an interminable gap of thousands or even millions of years, and then started this, um, continued this work of creation proceeding. <clears throat> I don't believe that that, is the, um, that that is the case. I referred last week that some of the translations, perhaps some of the older translations, there is an and between verse 1 and 2. So it's continuous. It's all part of the same process, the same day of what God is doing. So in essence, um, what God's word is saying is this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and it was without form and empty. And God said, let there be light. All part of that same process of what he was doing right at the uh, right at the beginning there i recall i used last week the perhaps weak analogy but an analogy nonetheless of a potter at his wheel that he will take a lump of clay put it on the wheel and then he will begin to shape and to form that lump of clay into a vase a a cup a plate a bowl whatever it is that he's uh, that he's deciding to make but it begins with a lump of clay. Now, I'm not suggesting that, that God just took a lump of something of anything. And this is where the analogy is weak. But it just helps us to try and understand that God created the vastness of the universe and all its galaxies. We were, we were caught up with that last week, weren't we? Seeing the vastness of the, this universe that God has created. And within one small corner of that universe, we get the detail of how he formed and shaped the earth so that it might be a place that is habitable for you and me. I commented, didn't we, last week, that just a, a short distance further away from the sun, then life wouldn't exist because it would be too cold. Life, life as we know it wouldn't exist. If we were a short space closer to the sun, equally it wouldn't exist. And so we see the perfection in creation of what God has ordered and ordained as he spoke these things into, into being. But to, to look at this analogy of the, of the potter and his lump of clay, he begins to, to work through his hands to shape the vase, the bowl, whatever it is. Now the wonder of the God that we have to do with, he doesn't only shape with his hands, and scripture speaks of that, the way that he stretches out his span for the distance between the stars, the way he pours out the oceans from the, the palm of his hand. But he speaks it into existence. The potter could never do that. The potter could never look at the lump of clay and say, be a vase. It just ain't going to happen, is it? But our God, the mighty God of the universe, spoke creation into existence he just said as we've as we've covered in this section let there be light four words in our language let there be light and immediately it was so I remember being corrected um, some years ago and speaking about this and saying that God said let there be light and and light sprung from his mouth at the speed of 186,000 miles a second well, if we're, if we're measuring something in terms of distance like that and 186,000 miles per second, that involves time. And time as, it, as, as we know it had not yet begun. We don't get that till day four. And so when God said, let there be light, it just happened. There was light. Just like that. <clears throat> Because he is God. And not just God, but the God of the universe. Now, I want to bring in a warning here. Don't try to rationalize God. Don't try to fit him into your own understanding of science. Don't even try to fit him into the scientist's understanding of science. And this is, this is where I think science, and I'm talking very generalistically here, you'll understand that, it, I'm, I'm talking broadly. And this is where science has got it wrong, because, because if we try to rationalise this by scientific understanding, you will make God smaller than he is. God is vast. The light that we experience today, lovely sunny day today, 
But even take away the sun, because remember, the sun came in on day four. Sun hadn't been created yet. This was just light. And God spoke it into existence. I think I, I mentioned this last week. I'm going to say it again anyway. Remember that if God becomes knowable in the sense of our being able to fathom him out, work him out, then he's no longer God. His ways are beyond our ways, the scripture tells us. His thoughts are above our thoughts. And so whilst as we, as we get to know God, as we, as we draw near to God and get to know him and we get to know the person of the Lord Jesus and as we spend time with Jesus, we discover and learn more about who God is, we will never fully fathom him out. We will never fully comprehend God in all the depths and the vastness of who he is. Because as soon as we do, then he's become something the same as us. He's become something comprehensible by the human mind. But God is beyond us. He's above us. And so we need to let God shape our understanding of science. Rather than, to try and, rather than to look at science and what the scientists have said and try to fit God and the biblical record somehow into that framework. We get it back to front, don't we? Let's start with the biblical record. Let's start with what God has said and then try and fit science into that framework. And this is the problem. This is, I go back to the, I, I, I know I keep harping on about the gap theory, but this was something that was drummed into me as a child. And I came to, to see that actually it's not of God. And this is the problem with the gap theory, this so-called gap between verse 1 and verse 2 of Genesis of, of millions of years. And that's probably when the dinosaurs were. That's what people teach. That's what many, some Christians teach. But there's problems with that, uh, with that principle. But what, the, where it's come from is that we discovered fossils and man in their human wisdom discovered that these fossils were millions and millions of years old. And so in order to try and fit that so-called fact into the biblical narrative, they've looked at it and they said, well, actually, if that's the case, there must be a gap between verse 1 and verse 2. But when you look at it in the whole tenor of Scripture and the whole theme of what God is saying throughout the book, not just in these opening verses, but throughout the book of the Bible, you see that it doesn't match what God is doing. And so we have to shape our understanding of science based on what God's word says. So even as we have these opening words of verse 3, you have to have a sense of awe that we've just sung about, don't you? When God said, let there be light. What's the response? There was light. But here we see God speaking and things come into being. And if we fail to see the majesty and the power of God demonstrated here in creation, then it will undermine our knowledge of who God is in all his majesty and glory. This is why I think that it, it, it had that reference, didn't it, in the teaser video that, uh, that we showed a couple of weeks ago. This is why it's called the seedbed of the Bible, because we, we have principles about the person of God, principles about how he works and operates that are formed right in these early verses, early chapters of Genesis, which help us to understand who God is and what he's about. Because if we say that, well, it's impossible that God could just speak, let there be light, and it happened. And if we say, well, it happened over gradual periods of millions of years and so on, what about when we come to the resurrection of Christ from the dead? Romans 6 tells us that Christ was raised from among the dead by the glory of the Father. You say, but that's impossible. Somebody raised from the dead three days after they died. Not when you consider the glory of the Father in heaven. And if you say it's impossible for God to speak these things into existence, to just say, let there be light, and it happens, 
If you say that that's, that's unrealistic and a, and, a, and a myth and a fantasy, as some people will say, if you say that, then it undermines every principle of what God does. And especially the, the, the principle of God raising Christ from among the dead. Because you go a little bit further on in the New Testament into, into 1 Corinthians, I think it's chapter 15, isn't it? 15 or 16. And it speaks there that if you're not, if Christ is not raised, then you are still dead in your sins. You've got no faith. Your faith is in vain. And so this is why I'm, I'm, I'm sharing that, that, that this principle right at the beginning that God did speak and it happened in creation. It starts the principle for us that the power and the majesty and the authority of God. That if God says he will do. And so just as he spoke the very creation that we live into being. That same power raised Christ from the dead. And as we discovered when we looked at Ephesians three years ago now, as we discovered in that, in that letter there, that same power that God, with which God raised Christ from the dead is towards us today. Hallelujah. This is the mighty God that we stand in awe of. And so we can see the importance of having a right understanding of who he is right from the beginning of Scripture. Now back to day one. I told you I was going to struggle to get through all this. God creates the light. <clears throat> you'll have noticed, and many of you will know this anyway, but you'll have noticed as we read the passage again that God didn't create darkness. God created the light. Darkness, of course, is the absence of light. We don't... Um, create darkness in a room we just take away the light or we switch off the light switch and if we have these fancy blinds these blackout blinds it's truly dark isn't it but to change that what do you do you introduce light by switching on the light switch so it was really interesting it's something i've not considered before we we were watching weren't we the um, the live video link from peter head last sunday evening and will graham spoke quite clearly and biblically I believe about hell and spoke about the fact that we often associate hell with with flames of fire but he suggested that there wouldn't we, there wouldn't be flames there because flames give off a light don't they and scripture is quite clear that that place is darkness utter darkness so it's something I'd not considered before that there will be no light whatsoever in hell because the light of the world will not be there and God here divides between the light and the darkness <clears throat> he brings in a separation and of course there's a moral lesson for us in that just as God has made a separation between the physical light and darkness, so must we morally. We must distinguish between works of light and works of darkness and not get the two confused, not bring any mixture at all. We must recognize, and, and here's one of the principles that we learn, we must rec recognize that God has made that separation, that darkness cannot mix with light. There is no mixture whatsoever. God has separated the light and the darkness. He's called the one day, he's called the other night. <clears throat> and so it is with moral issues, we mustn't confuse the two. The Bible teaches, doesn't it, about the day that we live in. The Bible teaches about people that will say good is evil and evil is good. I, I was trying to find the reference this morning before I came out. And I couldn't, um, couldn't quite find it. Somebody will be able to help me out later, no doubt. But that's the day that we're living in, isn't it? That which God has said is, is good, men today say is evil. And that which God has blatantly said and clearly said for us is wrong, is evil, men today say, that's okay. If you want to do that, as long as you're not harming anybody else, you carry on. But God has made this distinction between light and dark. 
And so it must be for us today. We, we must be governed by that principle of making a distinction between of what, is, what is morally light and good according to God's word and what is morally dark, that which is sin. Let's name it for what it is. And we need to have that distinction and that separation and understand that because this is the principle that God has established. Now, as I said, he's given these, these, this light and this darkness, he's given them names, day and night. Now, this was quite a revelation to me a few years ago. I, I just hadn't thought about it and I, I just want to share it with you now. Because we often think that we have day and night because of the sun. And the, and the Earth's position and its particular tilt and its rotation, um, its rotation on, a, on its own axis, but then its rotation around the sun. And we think of because of that, we have day and night. That's not what scripture suggests. Because as I said already this morning, the sun doesn't appear. The sun isn't created until day four, another three days later. So you say, well, well, how can that be? How can you have day and light when the sun isn't even created? Remember that attribute or that characteristic of God. God is light. God is light. And so that's how you can have this existing even before the sun was created and placed in its position in the universe and so on and so forth. Remember when you get to the heavenly city at the end of Revelation, Revelation 21. <clears throat> there are three things there that God says there are going to be, there's going to be no need for anymore. Can anybody remember what they are? What's the first of the three things that won't be needed in the heavenly city in Revelation 21? Sorry? The, the sun and the moon, and the, the sun and the moon is one of them. That's the one we come to. The first one is the temple. There'll be no need for the temple there in the city of in the heavenly city of God. Why? Because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb is there. And then, and then Revelation 21 goes on to, to speak of the, the same principle. There will be no need for the sun or the moon to shine upon that city. Why? Because Jesus is there. The glory of, the, of, 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 the glory of God, I think it says there, will shine upon that city. And the Lamb, Jesus, is the Lamb. So right at the end of creation, you have this light existing in this, in this heavenly city that God will create. But there'll be no sun and no moon. Why? Because God himself is there. And right at the beginning of creation, on day one of creation, no sun, no moon. But there's day and there's night, there's light and the darkness. Why? Because God himself is there. As I say, this was a wonderful revelation to me a few years ago when I, when I discovered it, just reading through it. I'd missed it time and time. You know, I'd, I'd read this passage hundreds of times, literally. I, 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 I don't lie, literally hundreds of times, because you always have that resolve. And certainly when I was younger, I had that resolve, January the 1st, let's start reading through the Bible. And in the early days, I'd get halfway through Genesis. As I got a bit older, I got halfway through Exodus and so on. So I've literally read chapter one of Genesis hundreds of times. And I missed it hundreds of times. But now I see it that the sun hadn't been created yet. So the light that was there was the light of God. And he spoke that into the creation that he was creating. Again, it, it, it just makes us stand in awe, doesn't it? That here we have this conception that we have day and night because the earth rotates around the sun, etc. No, we have day and night because God is there. He placed his light there by just uttering those words, let there be light. And it was so. What glory, what majesty that we see in God himself. We will discover when we get to day four that the sun has other purposes, of course, other than just distinguishing between day and night. But here God makes this distinction between the darkness, between the light, calls it day, calls it night. <clears throat> so verse five at the end of day one tells us that there was evening 
and there was morning the first day. Now I have to say here, this is my understanding of scripture, these are literal days, literal 24 hour periods. Not all Christians hold that view. Um, it is an issue. This one particular issue is with one that has divided Christians for many years. Some say that each day relates to ages or periods of time, maybe thousands or hundreds of thousands of years. Others say that the, 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 the specific days mentioned, the six days mentioned of creation, are specific 24-hour periods, but then there are thousands of years between each day. I subscribe to the fact of what God's word says. There was evening, there was morning, the first day. Get a little bit later on, it says the second day. Not the second day after a period of interminable years, the second day. Now, when we get to the end of chapter one, we'll see why, and, and, and I'll, I'll set out why I believe these are specific days. Because again, there's a principle that God teaches us when we get to day seven. It's the principle of the Sabbath, of course, but we'll look at that later on. I'm getting ahead of myself. Get all excited with these things. So we're talking here about a 24-hour period. <clears throat> so you say, Tim, why, if, if it's a literal 24 hours, why does it speak about the evening before the morning? We see in our Western society, we see the dawn of the morning as the sign of a new day, don't we? We have that lovely hymn that we sing, Oh, to see the dawn, and it speaks of a new day, doesn't it? Because Christ has now risen, hallelujah. But that's what we understand in our, in our Western culture, our Western society, that the dawn of the morning marks a new day. But it wasn't so in Jewish culture. Remember, this book was written by Moses. In fact, in other languages, they don't have the words, use the, the titles of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and, and so on. Uh, I remember when I used to go to Sweden quite frequently, and when I was preached in Sweden, they would refer to Genesis as the uh, Fushta Mosebuchen, I think it was called, the first book of Moses, the second book of Moses. And so they had the, f the five books of Moses. But this book, Genesis, that we're reading from today, was written by Moses under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Remember that the, the records in those days were kept by oral tradition. They would rehearse these things in the ears of each of the generations. And so it would be recorded after generation after generation. And the Holy Spirit prompted Moses to write these things down. And so Moses was living in the context of the children of Israel at that time and the culture that had developed at that time. Now, it wasn't just a culture that they, as the children of Israel, had created. Let's do this. Why don't we start the day in the evening? It comes from what God began at creation, where he said there was evening and there was morning the first day. And so even, um, even Orthodox Jews today observe this, don't they? They start their day in the evening, and you get to the Sabbath, and it doesn't start on Saturday morning. The Sabbath starts at about 6 p.m. on Friday evening. I remember um, we used to go down to London. Uh, when we lived in Birmingham, we used to go down to London fairly frequently. They had a monthly, they called it a fellowship meeting. It was a Bible study and address. And uh, the, the big hall that they used, it held about 700-odd people, um, was in um, Islington. And so we used to drive down from Birmingham, a couple of hours down the motorway, and we used to come off the M1 at the bottom of the, bottom of the M1, Junction 2, and, and approach the North Circular, is it? And we'd come past, I think it was the Finchley Mosque, the Finchley United Mosque, um, not mosque, sorry, synagogue. And as you got closer to the synagogue on a Saturday morning going to, to our Bible conference, you would see these Orthodox Jews walking along with their hats, with their, with their ringlets and their long black coats and so on. And they were walking because it's forbidden for them to do any work on the Sabbath. So they will walk everywhere, those that are Orthodox. And so you'd see them from two, three miles back walking to this synagogue. But there were some, and there are some, and I, I, I knew someone who lived close to a, 
to a synagogue, there are some who aren't so very orthodox. And they like to observe some of the traditions, but not all of them. And so they'll take their car and drive till just around the corner, get out of their car and walk the last bit of the way, just so they appear to have been do doing the right thing. Um, that's not just an orthodox Jewish thing. That's close to each one of our hearts, isn't it? That we like to appear to be doing the right thing. But God sees the heart. And the, the whole principle is that they have this day of absolute rest. And it starts at 6 p.m. on a Friday and goes through till 6 p.m. on a Saturday. And during those 24 hours, they don't work. And they do, they, 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 they spend time with their families. They, they come together as families. They go to the synagogue. They pray. They worship God. And this is the culture, and I use the word culture guardedly. This is the culture that Moses grew up in. This is what he knew. And it's not, as I've said, because they suddenly decided, the Jewish nation suddenly at some point decided, let's do this. Let's start our Sabbath on a Friday night. The principle is found here in what God says in his word. On the first day, there was an evening and a morning. Not the way we would look at it in the West. There's a morning followed by an evening, that there was an evening and then there was a morning. Now, it's little things like this, and I've gone into a bit of detail about that, but it's little things like this that show me, that demonstrate to me the authority of Scripture. That it's not just something that is, that is randomly being put together. God is speaking about what he did, literally, physically, when he created the earth. And what Moses records is, is what he understood by what the Holy Spirit prompted to him, what he'd heard from the traditions down through the generations, from Adam downwards. It's what he had heard time and time and time again. And he penned it down under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now, if this related to time periods, epochs, hundreds or thousands of years, then this reference would not be here, would it? That there was evening and morning the first day. And so this is why I understand that God created. He spoke over these six days. And the universe that we, as we know it, came into existence. Just from the authority of the very voice of God. Now I told you we weren't going to get through it. Days two and three, we'll have to leave till, uh, till next week because my time has, has uh, even gone. But again, as we consider this, let us have a sense of awe of who God is. Let's not try and explain things away in a way that will be intelligible to the human mind. Because we're dealing with things beyond the human mind. We're dealing with the God of the universe who is beyond our puny human mind understanding and he must always remain in that place because he is God we are part of his creation as we'll see when we get to chapter uh, when we get to day six we are just the creature we are just the made thing as it were God is the creator he is God and we need to stand in awe of him. So next time, God willing, we'll look at day two, the expanse or the firmament as it used to be called in the olden days in some of our older translations. <clears throat> and um, we'll also look at um, day three where the dry land appears and the vegetation appears. And all of these days, days one, two and three, looking at the forming of the world, ready for days four, five and six, which is the filling of God's creation. Let's pray. Father, we come to you. We come to you, and Lord, we say it again, but we do stand in awe of you. Help us to see you in all your majesty, in all your glory. Help us not to try and take these things in, but just to accept what you say in your word, O oh God. And as we continue through this week,
as we walk through this wonderful creation that you have made, as we appreciate the light and the separation between light and darkness, help us to walk according to your word. And may we learn to distinguish morally between works of darkness and the glorious works of life that flow out of the gospel. Help us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.